Ladies and gentlemen, quite some time ago, we did a series called Logic Components. And within that series, we took a look at various logic gates, as well as, well, putting gates together to create more complex components, right? Things like multiplexers and coders, as well as memory-based components. Back then, we considered the logic gates as a fundamental unit of computation, right? As basically the smallest unit of computation we can think of. But surely there is no such thing as a logic gate, right? You cannot simply find a gate and place it on a breadboard. Instead, these are made up of even smaller, even simpler components called transistors. This episode is the first of a series. What we're going to do is we're going to look at transistors. We're going to try and deep dive and understand them. And then we're going to use them to build a bunch of different gates and other components. It's been a while since we've done a series, so I hope you're as excited as I am. But yeah, without further ado, let us jump into episode 1 of the Transistor series. Hello and welcome to a brand new Transistor series. Now, as mentioned, we will be, well, learning about transistors, you know, how they work. And then we'll be using them to build stuff over you know, a whole bunch of episodes. This will probably take about two months or so. Today, let's confine ourselves to the simple question of what a transistor actually is. We will try to take a look at what's inside a transistor to make it work. And we'll try to see what is its purpose and how it actually fits into building a logic gate. So let's begin. Essentially, this is what a transistor looks like. It is a simple three-legged component. And the idea is, it acts as an electrically controlled switch. A transistor can be connected to something like an output via two of its pins. And depending on you know, whether the remaining pin is set to high or low, the currents on the other two pins are either allowed or prevents it to flow. And that basically is the first step to creating some computation. Really, that's all it is. It's just a switch, except it is a switch that can be controlled by another piece of current. The three legs of a transistor are known as the collector, the emitter, and the base. An alternative set of names for these pins are source, gate, and drain. Don't worry too much about the terminology, we'll go into greater detail later on. For now, what you need to know is that the emitter and collector are basically the two sides of your switch. Whether the switch is open or closed depends on what is indicated at the base. Transistors in common use today generally fall into one of two categories, field effect transistors or FETs and bipolar junction transistors or BJTs for short. These terms describe the technology that actually make the transistor do its thing. The names of the three pins are different depending on which type. Each technology has its pros and cons, and it's not uncommon to find both types of transistors in use side by side. For the purposes of this series, we'll stick to BJTs. You'll find that, at least for implementing simple logic gates, both technologies function the same. Regardless, these two versions all work on one same thing, and that is the concept of semiconductors. Let's begin by understanding what a semiconductor is and what it really means by doping them. To begin with, let's take a look at several basic rules that will govern the vast majority of what we're about to go through next. First, something very basic, and that is, well, there is a flow of charge, in other words, there is a current, when electrons actually move. Also, electrons carry negative charge. So yeah, their movement implies the presence of a current. However, one thing is a little bit strange, and that is, even though the electrons are flowing, well, in this direction, in this particular picture, we say that current flows the opposite way. Now, this is just an issue with conventions. Um, we'll try not to walk into this can of worms as much as we can, but yeah, just know that, well, that's how the convention works. Next, a follow-up to our first rule, essentially a place that is positive implies that it actually lacks electrons. When we talk about a lack of an electron in semiconductor terms, we sometimes use the word hole. It is a slot or an empty hole in which an electron can eventually reside. 
Do note that when we go further into talking about semiconductors, we tend to visualize holes like this, as if it's, you know, just a particle on its own. But really, it isn't. A hole isn't a particle, and even if we talk about holes moving, really, it's just an absence of an electron. Rule number three, essentially, well, opposites attract. Your electrons are attracted towards the holes, and basically when they come together, they combine. And what you get is basically, well, this thing that no longer has any net charge. After they combine, an equilibrium is reached, and there will basically be no more attempts on the part of the particle itself to move elsewhere. And of course, the opposite holds true. When you have two electrons next to each other, they repel, they try to move apart. So, with these basic rules in mind, let's now take a look at a process called doping. Essentially, you have a material, and the idea is you can add impurities which then affects their conductivity. There are two ways in which this can be done. If you dope a material with more electrons, this of course becomes more negative, and as a result, it gets known as an n-type semiconductor. Of course, conversely, if you dope a material such that it ends up with more holes, then you create a more positive material, also known as a p-type semiconductor. In and of itself, these aren't so interesting, but the magic really happens when you actually place them together. This is known as a p-n junction, and what you get is some interesting behavior. Let's take a look at this step by step. First, since you place your positive and negative next to each other, you expect them to interact, and they indeed do. The additional electrons from the n-type side will of course attempt to flow over to the p-type side and basically combine with some holes. What you then get is a depletion region, basically a small space in which electrons and holes are happily combined. When this region gets large enough, basically electrons can no longer flow to the other side where there are more holes, and so you get this sort of equilibrium state. The interesting behavior then comes about when we connect power to the mix. Let's start by putting the positive side to the P side and the negative side to the N side. And let's see what happens. Essentially, the negative terminal of the battery makes the N side more negative. This in turn causes a repulsion effect, and as a result, the electrons are pushed forwards. This causes the depletion region to actually shrink. And when the repulsion force is large enough, well, the depletion region completely disappears, and as a result, your electrons start to flow towards the positive terminal. Essentially, what you've then created is a continuous flow of charge, thanks to the fact that, well, your battery is there. So yeah, by basically powering your PN junction this way, charge flows, a current is created. Now, let's actually flip things around. Let's place our battery the other way around, so that the positive terminal now goes to the N side. Essentially, what happens now is this side becomes more positive, whereas this side becomes more negative. What you create then is an attraction. The electrons now get pulled towards the left, and what we eventually get is an even larger depletion region. Because of this, there is no way for charge to flow. And as a result, well, it doesn't. Therefore, what you've created here is basically a diode, a component that only allows charge to flow in one direction and not the other. Now, it seems like we've digressed a little bit by using, you know, a PN junction to build a diode, but as it turns out, a transistor is just that plus a little bit more. Let's take a look. So as it turns out, all you need to do to get a transistor out of a PN junction is to simply, well, add another either N or P type component to the mix. And essentially, what we get are either NPN transistors or PNP transistors. The name corresponds to, well, the actual structure of the components. For the vast majority of the time, we will be looking at an NPN transistor because that tends to be more intuitive, but today we'll be taking a look at both. Here's how it works. Now, as mentioned earlier, your three connections to a transistor are known as the collector, the emitter, and the base. So as you can see, we have them basically set up like this. 
Now, these two parts are your N-type semiconductors, while the base itself is a P-type. So what that means is, well, you create two depletion regions this time. So this is sort of its neutral state. With this picture in mind, let us go ahead and actually connect up the collector and the emitter. For an NPN transistor, your collector should go to the positive side and your emitter will go negative. And as you can imagine, this will cause one of the depletion regions to become larger and the other to become smaller. The electrons over here move towards the collector, while the electrons over on this side get repelled by the negative emitter connection. Again, at this point, nothing is flowing just yet, at least until we do something to the base. For an NPN transistor to basically get it going, we have to set up the base to be positive. This is what happens. Let's take a look at the right half of the picture first. As you can imagine, this now gets even more positive than it used to be, enough for this depletion region to break down and for the electrons to start to move towards the base. And when the voltage generated over here is large enough, well, you'll break down the depletion region on the left as well. And this allows electrons to flow the entire way. Essentially, when the base goes positive, electrons begin to flow from the emitter towards both the base and the collector. This is essentially our little switch in the on state. Of course, remember how we said just now that, you know, the actual flow of current is opposite to the direction of flow of electrons? Well, technically, for an NPN transistor, we say that the current flows from the collector to the emitter, even though the electrons are actually going the other way. But yeah, to follow the convention, we will have to say that basically the current goes to the right, as in the picture. That is an NPN transistor, and what you find is that for a PNP transistor, everything is basically just the opposite. We now connect the collector to the negative side and the emitter to the positive. The base is also flipped and now has to be negative in order to allow current to flow. Essentially, instead of having electrons drop off into the base, now the base is actually adding additional electrons into the mix. And this causes a flow of current from the emitter to the collector. So again, the actual flow of current is opposite to the direction in which the electrons are actually moving. So conceptually, a PNP and an NPN transistor basically work the same way. It's just that when it comes to the connections, we'll have to basically flip them around. And the direction of current is inverted as well. This is basically the whole concept, the whole idea behind a transistor. Now, we are basically ready to wrap things up for this episode, but I'd just like to mention some things we have actually omitted. First, the semiconductors in a transistor are actually doped to different amounts. This creates an operation threshold for the transistor. For simplicity, we've simply pictured the parts as N and P and ignored that difference. Next, you can actually connect a transistor such that the current flow is opposite as intended. This is generally not done as there is just no reason to do so and can result in damage to the transistor. Finally, a transistor can actually amplify the currents flowing between the collector and emitter. In fact, the current there is proportional to the current flowing at the base. Since we only want to use our transistors as switches in this series, this property is ignored. And there you go, that has been transistors. We have sort of gone in depth to take a look at how they actually work behind the scenes. Well, for the rest of our episodes within the series, we will begin to use transistors within circuits to try and, well, make some kind of computation happen. Today's video is coming out sort of on our prime time on a Wednesday, but future episodes will come out on Monday so as to not, you know, disrupt our Wednesday schedule. This is going to be a fun series, it's going to run, you know, anywhere between 7 to maybe 10 episodes, we'll see. But yeah, I hope you're as excited as I am. Transistors are really one of the most basic units of computation, you know, as they say on your CPU chip, it's just a whole bunch of transistors working in tandem. So yeah, this should be, you know, a good insight into what makes your computer tick. 
That's all there is for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you join me for the rest of the series. Again, that's it. Until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.